Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel, and today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Jimmy Johnson of Sand Dollar Communities. But before we dive in, I wanted to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind taking an extra 30 seconds and heading over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for making my day with that review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Jimmy Johnson is the founder of Sand Dollar Communities, which focuses on the sourcing of off-market, direct-to-seller mobile home parks. He has closed 34 mobile home parks in 14 different states. Jimmy also has founded Sand Dollar Communities Management, a mobile home park management firm that currently manages a growing portfolio of over 1,300 sites across the country. Jimmy lives in Tampa, Florida, and is an avid boater and fisherman. Jimmy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Excited to be here. Awesome, dude. Let's jump right in. Can you tell us about your story and how you got into manufactured housing? Yep, definitely. Uh, yeah, so I kind of got into uh, to real estate at first. I uh, was in college and, um, you know, wanted, I was playing soccer and was busy, you know, being a student athlete. And I wanted to, you know, obviously make some money and, uh, you know, wanted to do it on the side, kind of do it, you know, easy compared to clocking in to an actual job job because I just didn't have uh didn't have the time. And uh, I saw this ad on Craigslist for uh, just take pictures of houses that are in foreclosure. And it was like 20 bucks a house or something. So I'm like, this is like a dream come true. Do it at six in the morning, do it at 10 at night. So um, I ended up applying for that, got the job, which I think anybody who applied probably got it. (laughs) And uh, and started taking pictures of these foreclosures all around Florida. So it's like waking up in the morning, driving all around, from like down in the Everglades all the way up north and uh, planning it all out, trying to map the route. And uh, anybody in foreclosure, you know, didn't want a picture taken of them. So I kind of learned uh, some of the pros and cons of real estate then. But um, I had uh, often did uh, mobile homes when I was doing that. So that was kind of the first time I was like in parks and seeing, I'm like, hey, these are, you know, pretty nice. And I'm not doing many of these. It's mostly single families. So that was kind of the first time I kind of saw and kind of dabbled with a mobile home park. And then I uh, ended up uh, moving on past that, got a job like in the multifamily industry. And then from there, um, realized that just, you know, kind of tenants and toilets and turnover and maintenance, it was just going to just kind of eat me alive. And I just felt like it was a lot of um, just constant, you know, constant issues. And I wanted to be in something more passive. So I started doing the research and all the other asset classes, knew a couple of guys doing a mobile home park, started to listen to podcasts like yours and some of the other ones out there. And uh, I realized like, Hey, these guys who are doing parks, they're, uh, you know, they're doing what I want to do and uh, weighed all the pros and cons and decided to, to jump right in and uh, wanted to provide as much value as I could. And I'm like, what does everybody want? Everybody wants a deal. So that's how we got started and, uh, you know, wholesaling and uh, assigning parks. That is amazing. So I want to go back to you taking pictures of the, the foreclosed houses. Was that in like property preservation? Were you doing that like for asset managers or was that like for an investor that was trying to bid on those? For asset managers, so it was the banks and there was some middleman company. And I think she was probably making like 200 bucks a picture and I've been 20 <laughs> But at the time, I thought it was like the best gig in the world. I'm like, I'm going to do this forever. I'm sure. just going to continue to grow my little market share. Yeah. And I'll get better at it. I'm going to get like a better camera that I could just like stick out the window. And <laughs> I had this whole big, you know, plan to just take over these foreclosure pictures. And yeah. then eventually it, you know, it was good if they were all next to each other. But then I would start getting like one house in Orlando, one in Jacksonville. Mm two down in Fort Myers. And she's like, oh, I can give you 50 bucks for those. And my yeah. car was probably going to blow up if I did it for a couple <laughs> months. So I had to that's, sadly throw in the towel. Yeah, that's crazy. Cause I actually was in property preservation back in like 2010, 2011. 
and did something very similar. And in around Florida, it was like a hotbed, you know, there was a oh. ton of foreclosures and, uh, you know, we actually did property maintenance and, you know, inspections. So uh, yes. very, very uh, interesting that we have that little connection there way, way back in the early days. But there's, yeah. there was a lot more foreclosures back in 2010, 2011, compared to how many are out there today, right. uh, yeah. which, is a, which is a big difference. But yeah, so Jimmy, so. when did you buy your first uh, mobile home park? Or, or, or maybe, I know you started out with us signing deals, right? So maybe when did that all happen? And, and uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I know you, you did some pretty cool assignment deals. Maybe you can share that with the, the listeners. Yeah, definitely. So I, I started with Parks in uh, late 2018, early 2019, uh, so not too long ago. And it obviously it took a couple months before I closed my first deal. So the first one that I took like equity in and, you know, owned a piece of it happened in the third quarter of 2019. So I believe it was my fifth or sixth assignment deal. And then, um, yeah, I knew the park while I was already talking to the um, the seller for like going on a year and um, of course, you know, no documents, no records, super mom and pop, $80 lot runs, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, I just remember it was one of just a super mom and pop deal. And um, yeah, the, the guys who were going to, you know, take it down and buy it, they said, well, you know, we know you're going to, we're going to pay you this fee, but it seems like, you know, you just know this park like the back of your hand. You just talk to the seller just for hours and hours and hours. Would you want to stay involved long term? And then, you know, I ended up doing that like half equity, half fee. And then uh, since then, I've done that about 10 more times, um, taking equity in lieu of the assignment fee. Mm -hmm. So that was my first um, kind of ownership piece and a deal. So it was about, I would say probably nine months in um, to when I kind of first, after I first yeah. put one, first deal. That is absolutely fantastic. So maybe we can tell the listeners a little bit about like what assigning a deal is if they're not familiar with it. But basically, you know, long story short, right? You, you get a property under contract mm -hmm. and in the contract, you have an assignability clause where you're able to then assign it to a new buyer, mm -hmm. and, you know, for a higher price and take a spread. Yep. Right. Yep. Definitely. So, so it's a great way to start out. You know, you're building rapport, you're, you're doing the the hard work, right? The grunt work, yeah. you're making the calls, right? Like it takes Definitely. time because I've done it too. And mm -hmm. I know that like, it's a numbers game, right? In any sales gig. And <laughs> that's, that's impressive, man. So how many calls would you say you would have to make before <laughs> you would get a, a motivated seller on the line? I mean, it varies, you know, as with anything with a numbers game, <clears throat> some days it feels like it's the first call and it's like, you know, thank God <laughs> done for the day, got one. And other days, I mean, go weeks at a time. So it's more so turned in like a numbers game and just like in terms of time. So I mean, a lot of the ones from, you know, 2019, 2020, kind of those seeds then are kind of sprouting now. So it's been now, it's a lot easier now than it was when I first got started. So as with most things, like once you do it once, then it just becomes easier. And I think with any type of real estate, <clears throat> the first deal is definitely the hardest. So yeah. getting that first one was really tough, but now- a lot of it is not a lot inbound, but I do have some inbound. A lot of it's just following up with, hey, you know, you said call you in six months, call you in a year, call you next month. So <clears throat> more so warm leads now. But uh, if I was to average it out, it has to be at least a couple hundred phone calls for a <laughs> more motivated seller. Maybe three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, kudos to you, man, for putting in that work. That's awesome. Uh, Jimmy, what has been the toughest hurdle for you thus far in the business? I think definitely just, you know, keep on trying to do so many and just, you know, the volume. So I think a lot of people who are, you know, just looking to buy a couple parks, retire from their job, you know, kind of have the passive income. You don't really need that money. So you could, I think, go out, find two, three good deals or one bigger deal. And you could definitely have, you know, some good passive and not passive, but some good, you know, semi-passive active income coming in, manage a park, maybe hire a third-party manager. And you could, you know, not retire early, but, you know, work on that for, you know, a couple of years, get some deals or invest with some operators like yourself. And it doesn't take much, but for us, you know, because we're doing more of the transactional business, every day it's kind of just waking up, chasing more deals. So getting the 34 has, uh, has not been easy. So it's, uh, 
just kind of trying to stay active. I think it's getting more competitive and um, yeah, a ton of uh, demand and dwindling supply. So uh, it's been a hurdle just kind of every month, just trying to meet the goals and, and keep doing it. And, you know, fortunately we have and working hard and building the business to, you know, to grow, but it's, it's been a big hurdle, you know, just trying to do that while also um, balancing the management business and, uh, you know, operating the portfolio there. So always trying yeah. to, yeah, just prioritize and, you know, the deals, they, they go quick if you don't jump on them and the management issues, if you don't jump on those quick, a uh, little issue turns into a big emergency. So. Oh yeah. All too well. I uh, yeah. can relate to you there. No, I'm Frank Rolf, you know, on one of his, his podcasts and at his seminars, he says time kills deals. Exactly. And I wrote that out and I put it above my desk back in my office because it's just, it's so true, you know, so I can, I can yeah. relate to that as well. Maybe maybe t- share a little bit about the management and how your management team uh, is set up and, and you know how that's going with your current portfolio. Yep, definitely. Uh, yeah, so each park, you know, kind of starting from the, the bottom up, you know, each park has a manager, typically someone who lives in the park and um, they handle, you know, the day-to-day, you know, just all of the little stuff that pops up, violation notices, they're doing lot inspections, passing out the invoices, pinning up late notices, basically anything that, you know, we can't do because we're not physically right there. So they're, um, you know, I think they're kind of the backbone of a, of a good deal and, you know, a good successful long-term park because it, all that little day-to-day stuff, we have really good managers who run a tight ship and, you know, the tenants see them. And I mean, I think they're saluting the manager when they walk by. <laughs> And there's other managers who, I mean, they kick their feet up and, uh, hey, everybody do as you please. It's it's a party. So we got to kind of let go of those and, and get the good ones and train them. But I think that's definitely one of the most crucial parts of the business. And we even have some smaller parks that we manage in like the 10, 20 site range. And we have really good managers in there. They're, you know, getting hundred bucks off lot rent and they care, they like the job and most of them are doing it because they want a good community and they kind of want to be the one who has some quality control over that. So yeah, definitely that's the the foundation, the backbone, I think of a good long-term park is that. And then above the manager is, is us. So we're, you know, asset manage all these parks and we're the uh, liaison basically between the owner and the day-to-day manager. Because the owners oftentimes are working their W-2 or they're invested in other real estate. And a lot of them just don't want to do the day-to-day. And I don't blame them because a lot of it's not fun. But uh, so we're the, um, yeah, kind of the middleman between them. And uh, we have weekly calls with, you know, each one of the park managers where we um, kind of just go through everything, go through a lot of the KPIs and the metrics. This is who's late. What's the story? How are these violations coming along? Uh, when are you doing inspections? I mean, so we've really tried to systemize it, make it a machine just to, to grow in the scale. And, um, and then, yeah, then either kind of partners with us or above us is the owner operator. And uh, some of them, you know, we're talking to daily, others weekly or monthly. Um, and then yeah, at Sand Dollar, it's myself and I have two employees who help with uh the thousands of little nuances that pop up every day, but uh, running a pretty lean operation, but it's a, uh, it's working well. So that's fantastic, man. Maybe you could share some of those KPIs with us. You know, what are the the key performance indicators that you guys look at on a, a weekly and monthly basis? Yeah, one of the the most important ones is definitely collections because if you know people aren't paying, well, can't pay the bills and can't make money, which is why you know we're doing this. So. Um, yeah, that's the number one thing, because we also think that when the residents are paying their rent and they're paying their utilities, they care more. So people who are not paying typically don't care about much, let alone the community. So we're looking at that, you know, hardcore on the 5th and the 6th. So when we're doing late notices, we're looking again on like the 10th and the 11th. Some of the states that we operate on, you know, do like the stair stuff late fees where you can do like 12 bucks a day, $10 a day. So really very busy in between the first through the 12th. And then we'll typically look again by the 20th. And that's when we'll kind of be deciding, 
hey, what do we have to escalate to an eviction or a non-renewal? So the collections, primarily, we really um, look a lot at the inspections and the violations. So depending on the size of the park and the type of park, if it's like a turnaround or stabilized, we either do them weekly or monthly. And we obviously don't want like the violations number growing. So we want to see that dwindling each month. Keep an eyes on that. Another thing is vacant homes, vacant lots, how long it's taken to sell a home, you know, just how many people are delinquent on maybe utilities, how many people are delinquent on, you know, other, you know, violation notices and, and stuff like that. But primarily we're, you know, looking for good collections and then we don't want any vacant homes because kind of leasing solves all the problems and vacant homes are a, a little hot spot for uh for crime as you know so yeah no most definitely most definitely well thanks for sharing those with us jimmy what's the number one way that you find your deals just relationships as a whole so how that relationship starts you know is typically with a cold call or direct mail door knock and get an intro so we really, everything that we do, we just try and have the best relationship possible because we've been, you know, referred from, you know, we close a deal with one seller and all these guys talk typically and they're saying, hey, you should call Jermaine. You know, we closed, it was smooth, it was easy, you know, great transaction. So really it's just, you know, relationships and trying to just build those, you know, genuinely. So we don't do like mass market mailers. We don't do texting or voicemail campaigns or robo calling and all that all the calls come straight from my cell phone uh, i know a lot of people disagree with them they're like no you have to have like a dialer and the sellers know it's coming from a different area code there's that little one two second delay yeah so we just really just try and be so genuine even when we're sending direct mail a lot of people use the kind of metered mail and they're like, oh, well, I'm paying an extra 10 cents and a computer is signing it, but it looks like my signature. <laughs> These sellers know they're like, you know, a hawk looking at all those little things. Yeah. And I've met with a lot of these guys and they have like a garbage bag full or a shoebox full of mailers. So we, I mean, we handwrite um, the return address and the um, seller address on the envelope. We put a real stamp on there. And these things take like four or five minutes a piece because we handwrite the letter too. Wow. But that's what, you know, that's what's genuine. So every part of it, you know, we're doing, uh, I, I haven't really outsourced any of the, the marketing. It's something that I really love to do. And um, as you said, I mean, time kills deals. And if that seller is calling back, that can't go into a funnel. So that's got to yeah. come right to me. I've got to pick up that call, return that tax. So it's just very, you know, typical per a, a date night out. I'm running out the restaurant, you know, talking to some seller at nine o'clock <laughs> on Friday. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, that's dedication right there. Yeah, it has to. Time kills them. So there you go. There you go, man. Uh, Jimmy, so for the passive investors out there, you know, the LPs that, like you mentioned earlier, would would like to put their money to work, but they don't they don't want to be involved in the day to day management. You know, if if this was going to be like their first mobile home park investment, what would you say that they need to look out for, you know, before investing in their first mobile home park? Yeah, definitely just track record of who they're, you know, going to be investing with. So I think if, especially if you're someone who maybe is dabbling some other types of real estate, you have invested in some syndications and you want to get into mobile home parks, I think that, you know, unless you're ready to kind of jump in and kind of be available 24 seven, I would invest with an operator who has done, you know, multiple deals and who you can hop on the phone with. And even if you're investing 25, 50, no matter how much, I think that person should definitely want to have a call with you, whether it's a zoom call, phone call, kind of walk through, you know, kind of what they're doing, the types of deals that they're buying. And then I think that, you know, you should be able to see, Hey, where is the portfolio? So I know you just sent out your um, quarterly newsletter. I love reading that. And you have in there, you know, where all your deals are at, different CapEx projects, all that stuff that really just shows that, you know, you're somebody who cares about these, you're super involved. And I think that's what, you know, a passive investor should be looking for. And just 100% transparency. Hey, you want to 
you know, you live in South Carolina or you live in Pennsylvania, here's a park that we own and operate there. Feel free to take a drive through. Here's the address. And I just think being very open, I think any sense of uh, kind of beating around the bush or not being open, I think is like a big red flag. So somebody who's, you know, very vocal and, and open with here's what we're doing. Here's where the money's going. And I think, yeah, like that quarterly newsletter that you sent out, I mean, that's like hit the nail on the head for just transparency. And we try and be super transparent with all of our deals. But, you know, I think from an investor looking, that's just important to be able to see the parks, see the improvements that have been made, see that positive momentum's happening, maybe some successful exits, refer to other investors. And uh, yeah, basically kind of, you know, just almost doing a background check, like on a tenant, but doing a background check on uh, the, you know, the guy that you're about to uh, invest some serious cash with. So. Yeah, I love that. And, and I do get your newsletter as well. And I read that and I see uh, the same thing. So thanks for the, the nice comments. I, I, I like yours as well. You did say something that I, that really strung a chord with me. And you said, you know, go, go find a park and drive through it that this operator is operating. I think that's huge. I mean, what better way could you get a testimonial on mm-hmm. this operator's, you know, management and, mm-hmm. and success or failure than just driving through one of their communities? So Definitely. if that's a possibility, you know, if you live nearby, I think that's a great way to, you know, gauge a, an operator's, you know, just talent and, and abilities, right? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, even with the assignments, there's a park that we assigned and we manage that's in the town that I live in outside of Tampa. So a lot of times we tell people if they're on vacation down here in Florida, hey, we manage a couple parks in Florida, here's the address. Or if they come into town to visit and we're grabbing dinner or something, I'll drive them through. It's only 20 sites, but I'll still drive them through it and show, hey, this is, you know, kind of so they could see concrete. This is what, you know, our typical deal looks like. And then, I mean, it's helpful that all the tenants know me there. So they're waving, they're smiling. <laughs> and, and, uh, but yeah, I always try and uh, just be super open. Like here's the address. And uh, yeah, especially yeah. the bigger the portfolio, if you have stuff all over the country, you can always, uh, yeah, just float it by and people can swing by yeah. when they're done. That's huge. And, and what would it cost, right? To pay someone to do a drive-through of mm-hmm. one of these, these communities, even if it is multiple states away, you know, they could put you know, a little gig up on Craigslist. I'm sure they can hire someone for a hundred bucks to go do a drive through and exactly. it will be such valuable information before you outlay, a, you know, six figures worth of cash. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah. Then and especially seeing like a before and after video. So you will always mm-hmm. like try and do a video the day of closing. So nice. then we could say 90 days in, a year in, maybe at the exit, hey, look at the difference between day one and then the next time period, especially if you're like infilling or, you know, doing stuff like that, we could really see a concrete, you know, big difference in that video. I think that's kind of worth its weight in gold to, uh, Oh yeah. Be able to show that's huge. That's huge. Jimmy, what is your deal criteria and why? Yes. Yeah, so it's a good question. So, I mean, ours is a lot different than I think most people's and that, you know, we're going into these deals knowing that we're going to assign them. So we have some people who will only buy 100 sign up parks. We have like another guy, for example, he'll buy anything in North Carolina that we have under 10 sites. So we're kind of every deal criteria possible because we're trying to meet everybody else's criteria. But what we, uh, you know, what we focus on and kind of, you know, specialize in and look for is like 20 to 70 site parks that are mom and pop, the less documents, the better typically in like a second tier market. So we're not really chasing stuff in the the big top 10 metros. We're doing like smaller stuff or like an hour outside of the bigger cities. Yeah, that's just mom and pop, no docs. Typically there's uh, something that looks like really hairy on the surface that oftentimes once you kind of dig in the diligence, it's not that bad. Or going into deals that do have more of like a heavy heavy value add component. Maybe it's on septics that needs to be converted to city sewer. Maybe there's 20 vacant homes, something that a lot of other people have heard and they just hung up the phone. So we, uh, you know, some private utilities that scare a lot of other people away. I mean, we, we get those at, you know, really, you know, kind of rock bottom wholesale prices. So we did a deal last year that was on a treatment plant. 
And this guy's like, yeah, you know, everybody calls and they're like, oh, it's 75 sites and all tenant owned homes. We're so happy. They hear it's on a treatment plant and they hang up. <laughs> so then we're like, no, no, we, you know, it sounds like you're taking care of it. And, you know, we're definitely open to that. So we got it at like less than 50% of, uh, wow. you know, the market value and everybody was happy. The seller hadn't saw it in over 10 years. He was out in San Francisco. The park was, you know, out here on the East Coast. And uh, he's like, I haven't seen the thing. He's like, I think the manager, I know the manager's just stealing money. And um, yeah, so we kind of just look for those, the guys, uh, the guys who want to sell, who they don't really care about the price more that they care who it's going to. So we spend a lot of time just hopping on the plane, flying up, meeting with sellers, you know, talking about hunting and fishing and, you know, just different, you know, random local stuff. And it's very typical, the same thing happens, you know, it's uh, the husband and the wife, I oftentimes bring my girlfriend with, and the husband's like, everything is so good, we might keep it forever. And then him and I will like, go take a walk. And the wife is telling my girlfriend, Oh, my God, this thing's a train rock. Like, <laughs> it's all he does. <laughs> so it's, uh, they're all like, pretty much the same. And I, I joke that if like, every of the 34 sellers that we've worked with got together in a room, it would be like the same 34 people, like, all, <laughs> like a mirror image because they're all. That like, is, <laughs> yeah, that is hilarious. So you in, include your girlfriend. I love that. What does she think of the of the business and, and of the industry you chose to get into? Definitely very highs and lows, I think, with the. <laughs> <laughs> she A lot of it's one day trips. So we like we'll leave the first flight out. And we typically have to fly out of Orlando, being it's a bigger airport. So we have a lot of four or five in the morning, leaving the house in Tampa, driving to Orlando, flying, connecting through like Charlotte or Atlanta, landing, meeting the seller for like five, six hours, coming back to Orlando, driving home. So we have like a ton of like 20 to 24 hour days. So, uh, those uh, are always, you know, fun, but <laughs> a hey, lot those, of that. Yeah, they'll yeah. be worth it. You know, it's just, it's just part of the business, you know? Yeah, that and yeah, vacant park on homes. We walk through a lot of those together. And I, I think it's actually been helpful because like the, um, the guy seller. So typically, you know, the, the wife and she'll be like, I'm not even going in there. And then the guy will bring us in and the, the floors are soft and, there's like, of course, still food in the fridge. And oh yeah, they uh they took off last night, but you could totally tell they were gone like a month ago. <laughs> and then she'll like, you know, put her shirt over. <laughs> it smells and the guy's like, yeah, I guess it is. It is worse than I thought. And maybe <laughs> these aren't worth as much. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, we have a really good time doing it. We always try and uh, incorporate, you know, something fun if we're like staying overnight, like we'll go out in the town and, you know, try and, you know, we were up in West Virginia recently. So we like went to some of the state parks and uh, if it oh, was just fun. strictly parks, it would be pretty rough. So we try and incorporate, you know, at least one fun thing. Per, that's cool. Uh, per site visit. Yeah, no, that sounds familiar. Walking through those, uh, the vacant homes with, <laughs> with the sellers, those I, I have, quite a few stories as well. I'm sure you have some good ones. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, what does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes and why? Yeah, it's another good question. I think there's kind of two of them. Of course, the perfect park for everybody is all tenant owned homes, stabilized, um, 100% occupied, directly built city water, city sewer, the city owns and maintains the lines, great metro, uh, you know, of course, wholesale price, big upside. So kind of just, that's like the perfect deal, dream come true. But for us, kind of perfect deal looks like uh, somebody who's owned it, you know, 20, 30 years, they've really cared. They often built the park. There's, you know, maybe half park owned homes, half tenant owned homes, a uh, lot rent. They don't really like tenant owned. Oh no, why would you want tenant owned park owned homes make more money? So we love hearing that because that typically means the lot runs like a hundred bucks. Um, <laughs> yeah, typically, you know, utilities that they're still paying for, but could and should be um, 
some metered or direct build. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, I, I wish every park kind of met the first one, but a lot of them are, yeah, kind of hairier deals that, uh, yeah, I mean, just mom and pop who really loves the park and who really cares. We've had a lot of sellers who, um, I mean, they're literally there like nine to five every day. So that's their job. They have one park and they know every tenant. We drive through and they're like, you know, with their notebook, writing down, okay, this person pays this much, this person that much. <laughs> so that's like our perfect park is somebody who we're lucky if we get a rent roll and they just love the park so much and they never really thought they were going to sell, but they just got, got tired and they want to start cruising and going on vacation and they're just ready to, you know, pass it on to somebody who cares. Pass it on to the next generation. Yep. That's uh, sounds familiar as well. Jimmy, what common mistakes do you feel, you know, new operators and just operators in general, you know, can make, you know, and what are, what mistakes maybe are easy to make that might get overlooked? Yeah, I think, uh, just not like really being 100% prepared. So I think you definitely want to not have like analysis paralysis, but definitely spend some time listening to the podcast, you know, talk with other operators and, you know, make sure you have a good, you know, good foundation of like information before you step in. And then the day one, especially if you're buying it yourself, being a just hundred percent ready that, you know, you got to be there the first day. You have to have some sort of transition letter with this is how you're going to pay and kind of walk through all the scenarios like of a resident. So I think that's like a mistake that I see made a lot is people don't kind of predict all the scenarios. So they'll say, Oh, I'm only going to have my residents pay online, no money orders, no checks, nothing. And then they tell them that and then they don't realize maybe the closest cash pay option is 45 minutes away. And a lot of the residents are older, maybe some of them don't have cars and now you're scrambling. So I think just setting a good foundation and being ready for the dozens of little kind of management problems that you have to solve on a daily basis. And if you're not ready for that, you should invest with somebody like yourself who has a team who's gonna do that. So I just think it's that and then, um, if you're buying a deal, not feeling like you're forced into it. So I always tell people with the assignments, we like never do hard money deposit. We never force anybody in. We try and give as much time as possible and get all the red flags out of the way in the beginning because we want someone to be so excited for closing and never having like any second thoughts or second guesses. There's always unknowns with these because the due diligence process is just so so tough, but we, we try and make sure that, you know, Hey, you want hundred percent want to do this because I think people are often forcing deals because they have to buy their first deal or they really want to buy their second. So they're kind of just, Hey, it's doesn't meet my criteria. I don't really know how I'm going to operate this one. It's a turnaround and I'm just going to buy it anyways though, because I need to buy a deal. So just making sure you're hundred percent comfortable. Yeah, I agree. I think the due diligence process is is often overlooked by by new operators that maybe haven't gone to Frank and Dave's boot camp and you know, it's a very involved process and literally can save you thousands of dollars, you know, in in catching things up front and you know, you're going to have to kill deals because of what you find. And we kill sure. deals all the time and you know, it's not fun to, to have to do it, especially when you got a bunch of cash out on the table for assessments and inspection reports. Uh, but you just you got to do it. So Definitely. that's that's a big part of it. Yeah, and uh, Frank Dave's event. I mean, it should almost be a prerequisite to go and see. And Frank <laughs> is such a great guy, and I've been on his show a couple times. And yeah, just going and seeing him point out the stuff in the park when they do that park site visit. Then at least I think you know before going in your first deal this is what skirting is. This is what an eighties yeah. versus a nineties home. And I think, yeah, just having that, that base level foundation of info is, is really important. Very, very important. Yeah. Spe specifically the utility infrastructure too, you know, is very important to get an understanding of that. Definitely. Jimmy, what do you think about uh, like the, the manufactured housing industry as we move forward, you know, and then into the next five to 10 years, you know, what, what hurdles do you think the industry, you know, will face? 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, various hurdles. One of them is definitely, um, it's a crazy hot market right now. And I think we're going to see some deals that are being bought now coming up, you know, coming back up for sale and kind of fire sale scenarios in the next, you know, kind of 12 to 36 months. I think people are buying in uh, super low cap rates and buying stuff that they maybe shouldn't be, or they're kind of hoping on appreciation. So I think a lot of those, I mean, it's going to be tough to make money on those, tough to, you know, add value and, you know, do the CapEx that's needed. So I think some of those are going to come back um, in the near future at pretty much what they paid, even after they've maybe raised the runs and added some upside. So I think that's one of them. Another one is just with everything that's going on right now with just minimum wage and the economy and where our rent's going up and single family and multifamily and everything. It's all just kind of one, one big thing. So I think there's going to be a lot more demand for the product that we have. So I think that, you know, it's going to be easier to sell and lease up homes because I think more people are going to be getting kind of priced out of single family. So they're going to want affordable housing. So I think, you know, good, you know, just good operators, I think are going to do going to do well. And I think that'll be a big thing is just, you know, operating well with the current climate, you know, it's often a little bit tougher to evict right now. And just making sure, you know, you're doing good screening, good background checks, you're not getting stuck with kind of professional tenants. So I think that and then just as kind of all the mom and pop deals get bought up, I mean, they're, it's never going to run out, but a lot of these sellers now that, you know, we're both talking to, and I mean, they are 80, 90 years old. They built the park 30, 40 years ago, and they're going to sell now. And whoever buys it is not going to sell for pennies on the dollar with a ton of upside. So I feel like the window of opportunity is definitely dwindling. And then as that window dwindles, the deals that are left are going to be kind of more reserved for the more savvy operators that's going to be hairier stuff or kind of good for people building a portfolio because it's a lot easier if you have you know 10 parks in Illinois and then there's a super hairy deal that pops up in Illinois with vacant park owned homes and maybe some utility infrastructure that needs to be upgraded it'll be easier for you to take that on because you already have the team and the systems everything in place there compared to somebody who that would be their first deal in the area. So I think there's going to be a a bigger delta between the really good savvy operators and people who are just, you know, just trying to make a quick buck in this and who don't really care. So. Yeah, no, you bring about some really good points there. Tell us about sand dollar communities. You know, what's, what's your value proposition? What, what makes you guys different? Yeah, great question. Uh, We've all kind of our informal slogan at Sand Dollar is, you know, we do what other people don't. So other people don't want to call all day. Other people don't want to fly across the country to meet with a mom and pop that we haven't even discussed the price with yet. Other people don't, you know, want to do the day, you know, 24 hour long trips there and back in the same day. So our value proposition is, is just that, you know, we're always going to take that extra mile and kind of not throw in the towel when um, other people might. So it's that. And then it's just that we, it's just so relationship-based on both the seller and the buyer side. So there's other people out there, especially, you know, people who are coming in the parks who maybe, you know, wholesale single family or multifamily. And they think, Hey, this is just a transactional like machine business where it's just motivated sellers. So a lot of it, these sellers aren't really motivated. It really is just building that rapport and that relationship with them. So I think it kind of, that our relationships pay off in the pricing that we get because there's deals that we've had at one in South Carolina where the guy wanted to talk every Friday, I think it was at eight o'clock at night for like over a year until he was ready. So every <laughs> Friday, we were calling this guy, hey, you know, what's up? How's the park going? Oh, a house burned down, you know, this, that, just hearing about, just letting him vent, letting them talk. And we have a lot of those just recurring weekly or monthly calls that most other people are like, hey, this is my offer. Do you want it? Yes or no. I've got other parks to buy where we're 
And of course, it doesn't always work out, but we're kind of just building those relationships that are so good. So then when it's time to buy that park and we've got it, you know, for just you know such an attractive price, I think that's our, our value proposition is the relationships and the fact that we're uh, when others are going right, we're going left with uh, our marketing and even how we assign the deals to the buyers. It's not whoever's going to pay the most. It's, you know, who's confident, who's going to close, even if it's a lot less of a fee. You know, we've done a lot of first time buyer deals to where, you know, the oh, brokers don't even pick up my phone calls and, you know, I'm too busy working a day job to get a hold of the sellers. I really want to buy a park. I'm going to come down. I'm going to meet you. I want exactly this. And when you get it, you know, I, I really would like if that can just come first to me. So we've done a lot of, uh, just rela- just the relationships on both sides of the transaction. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Uh, Jimmy, how can our listeners get a hold of you if they'd like to do so? Yeah, so the best would be just to shoot me an email. It's jimmy at jimmyjohnson.co. So it's just .co, not .com. So that'd be the best way. I'm also on Instagram at Florida Jimmy. You could try searching me on Facebook, Jimmy Johnson, but there's probably like a million other Jimmy Johnsons. So uh, maybe type in Jimmy Johnson Mobile Home Parks and it'll show up or something. But uh, the best would be just to shoot me an email and then uh, we can hop on a call and, and take it from there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Jimmy. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and uh, really appreciate the time. Awesome. Well, that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, are you getting value out of this show? If so, would you mind please going over to iTunes and leaving the show a quick five-star review? I have a goal of hitting over a hundred five-star reviews by the end of 2021, and it would mean the absolute world to me if you could help contribute to that. Thanks ahead of time for making my day with your five-star review of the show.